Welcome to Liberty and Logos. This is episode eight, where we will be looking at themes of liberty and autonomy, or possibly liberty versus autonomy, depending on how the discussion uh, works out. Uh, I'm Amory Devereaux, your, your co-host here with uh, Bellamy Fitzpatrick. And uh, Bellamy, you've got some uh, things you want to bring up to start us off by talking about the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. Yeah, so I've been threatening to do something on Chaz or Chop, as you prefer, for a little while now, and I'm thinking I'm still going to do a separate episode where we look at this in a bit more depth, but I think given recent events, we are recording, I should mention, on July 1st in the afternoon, uh, in the afternoon Eastern Standard Time, and as of uh, in the wee hours of this morning, Chaz was moved in upon by the Seattle Police Department and is being cleared out. I think this is both the end and very much not the end of this phenomenon because this sort of energy and this sort of propaganda of the deed is sure to result in different manifestations in different places. I'm already seeing that there are... Um, protests happening in New York City in a very intense way right now. And um, so it seemed right to uh, at least comment on it in a preliminary way. Well, you and I both had the opportunity in terms of the logistics of our own lives. So I've been communicating with uh, two different people who have been on the ground to varying degrees and their speculation, which, you know, they're individuals, who have their own points of view, who were more or less, in, in one case, very present throughout the events, is that the the recent shooting, which is an unusual event that's hard to suss out exactly what happened, and also the protests going very near to the mayor's house were the proximal trigger for the police to finally crack down. And it's kind of funny if that is true because of course the mayor was initially giving all this lip service support to the phenomenon and then you know perhaps it got a bit hot and then there was a change of view but that I, that's not clear to me at all this is just um you know some people's assessment of the situation and we you and I were talking right beforehand how one of the ways in which I'm increasingly exhausted by mass politics in what I think is a salutary way is the fact that anytime an event like this happens right from the beginning with Chaz, you see so many pundits, social critics, politicians of different types, activist politicians, professional politicians, take any unusual phenomenon such as Chaz and just put it through their partisan spin machine where you just have an input of any unusual phenomenon, this quick and dirty, often bad faith, often uh, un under theorized analysis. And then the output is, therefore, this proves my you know, particular political position. And at the same time, you have everyone siloing. Most people um, don't consume a wide range of media and are siloed. And it, it's just unfortunate how powerful the spectacle or simulation, whatever you want to call it, becomes because you're so cut off from a phenomenon that's interesting, unusual, you're trying to see what's happening, and you just get these bad faith pundits who don't want to take an event and try to understand it on its own terms, but instead just say, oh, you know, look at these ridiculous commies, or, you know, the the Chaz is absolutely amazing, and we have no problems here, and, and so forth. And, you know, the, I think many people at Chaz were willing to admit that they're were a whole range of problems, and maybe we'll get into some of those today, but that was just my kind of first take on it, and I'd be curious to hear yours. Yeah, well, I guess, uh, you know, uh, the it's up to the viewer's discretion and uh, to decide whether or not my analysis it fits the pattern of this uh, machine that you described, um, or if there's something in it, but my first thought really was, to what degree is this autonomous? Now, obviously, in terms of the name, they eventually settled with, oh, actually, it's just an occupied protest. It's, just mm -hmm. a, it's more like an event than a zone. Right. But my, if my understanding is correct, uh, that 
it was both ended by the police in the early hours this morning, but it was also begun pretty much by their withdrawal, right? Yeah, I think you could say there was a kind of vacuum of state presence, a vacuum of power that was occupied. And, you know, we're talking about something incredibly small. You could walk across it in a minute. Um, And so I guess some of the things that worry me are what exactly was the to, to what degree was there a goal once this thing was announced or was it more or less a sort of seizing the opportunity to have a sort of uh, a kind of spectacle and then the the sort of motivations were sort of almost a second thought and uh, in various rhetorical statements that were made sort of added later I don't know. I don't know to what degree this is a, a product of autonomy, and still not clear to me. Mm-hmm. Um, it might be good to define autonomy, but because you mentioned to me just before we started wanting to go down a particular way, I'll just say first that I think the name change was significant in the sense that autonomous zone being a reference to Hakim Bey, aka Peter Lamborn Wilson's book, Temporary Autonomous Zones. And Peter's book, which is a a kind of poetic, visionary, and kind of uh, supra-political or sort of anti-political book, he talks about an autonomous zone being a, a, a kind of spontaneous phenomenon where one is able to I find it funny that I'm invoking the Bible here, but uh, be what to, in the world, but not of the world. Um, so where one can uh, get a glimpse of how things might otherwise be, experience a, a kind of celebratory, ecstatic period of freedom with the idea that a kind of deprogramming or a breaking of the mind forged manacles is a key step. And, and also just to get a taste of what a different way of being could be, even if one never lives to see it realized in a large way. And uh, and that's a, that's a really quite specific phenomenon, even though it might sound like I'm being vague. And it's more specific because he's using it in a way that uh, that that spontaneity suggests uh, a, a very clear volitional act uh, of, you know, I'm going to create the situation, the the, the conditions for my own pleasure or artistic expression or camaraderie or whatever here and now, this is what I'm going to do. And uh, so tying those two things together, when I look at the, when I look at the chairs, I think to what degree was there this sort of, thinking about it in those terms um because like literally obviously autonomy means like making your own rules or making your own law and that could be seen as like making your own rules of the game uh in a sort of more loose artistic reading of 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 taz or it could be seen as you know um right well the police are gone and we're going to set up our own polity and here are the, the ways in which we're doing it. Now, one of the things that, to bring in another point, one of the things that makes me worry, wonder about autonomy is that rather than sort of making a statement about the place itself as if it was some kind of uh, entity, they're, they're talking about the demands that they make of the local, state, and federal government. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and certainly in Hakim Bey's piece, there's one, uh, there's not necessarily a broader political project outside the moment. It's the act is supposed to be sort of self-realizing and self-fulfilling in it. Two, it's not expected or even meant to last in a semi-permanent or permanent way, although that idea has kind of been taken, his idea has been taken up to 
say, okay, well, what would it mean to do this for longer periods of time? But in the original sense of it, it was never meant to to be that. And uh, even speaking to Peter recently, he uh, not about chess, but uh, about something else. He talked about, you know, the problem when people try to push it past its sort of um, expiration point or or that sort of thing. But third, it's certainly not meant to be a platform for petitioning the local authorities. So I think the shift to organized protest actually was that group maybe realizing more what it was. Mm. I think it, it, from my limited outsider's point of view and my access through a couple of people who were there, it seemed to maybe start off more more as and then go more up. Right? Yeah. And, you know, the demands are interesting. I think they're worth looking at in terms of the their relation to autonomy, right? So if you had a sort of uh, purely secessionist group that had taken control of the zone and they wanted some kind of, they were making demands, you would expect them to be demands about their ability to continue to exist autonomously, right? Demands related to a an increasing cutting of ties with the dominant economy, with the authorities, that sort of thing. Yeah. So they, you know, if they're going to put a, a, a line around their zone, you would expect their demands to be like, okay, well, we've got this um, particular policy in this zone, and we want to be able to continue to do that. Um, but you know, I've looked here, there their demands, they they asked for defunding the Seattle Police Department. Right. Okay. Um, then uh, an increase in funds for community programs. Right. So that is, that is not that is not something that directly relates to autonomy in my mind. Yes, of course. Like redistribution of wealth. Yes. Um, and then uh, you know some, some very strange things about the dropping charges for all protesters. Mm -hmm. uh, do they mean all protesters? Do they mean, um, you know, people who are out uh, the week or two before they got started asking for an end to, to the lockdown? Um, and, and, and again, like when they, when they seized the area, they said that they were seizing it in the name of the Seattle people, the people of Seattle, mm -hmm. which is another sort of vague term. It's very red politically. It's very red, and it's also like it's silly because you know, let's say that I was a a, a, a resident of Seattle. Well, that would include me. So you're claiming this land in the name of someone who has politics that you would severely disagree with. You know, it's mm -hmm. this assumption. I, again, there's this idea that always comes up with these kind of movements that they they're not only on the side of the right, but that necessarily almost everyone that's not completely evil must agree with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In your plan, you've talked about how we should discuss briefly what is sort of good, bad, and ugly about it. Mm -hmm. I think it does have to be mentioned that there were four shootings in sort of 10 days yes. in a tiny, tiny area, right, which represents uh, 0 0.07 square kilometers. <laughs> if, uh, if you were to consider uh, that same rate of shootings for New York City, it would it would have meant forty five thousand shootings in ten days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that would have been an absolutely unprecedented level level of shooting. So this is for, for such a small area and to have four shootings in that time. I think is a, is a very worrying sign. And um, there could be different interpretations of that. I'm sure people will have things to say about it. But I think it's really worth mentioning. I like to do maths with things sometimes and just wonder well, what, what would this mean if this was on a larger scale sure yeah i think i want to address the shootings more in the subsequent episode that i talked about but yeah, yeah point point well taken for sure uh there's speculation about how that that most recent shooting with the uh, van which was a van with no plates on it uh that entered the forcibly entered the the chop is my understanding 
and you know some unusual phenomena and questions around what was really going on there um, and whether whether or not it was reasonable for the people to defend themselves in that way because you know depending on how you view it it was a, a kind of attack um, we, again questions to be answered about what that means and what it, what happened um, I mean the other thing you know we talked about I guess since we're talking about it for a moment more the good and the bad um, well I'll start with the bad the bad being the statements that we made before about autonomy and is this really an autonomous zone I mean, the, the material facts on the ground and logistics meant it never could be autonomous uh, for more than a, a very short time. They were dependent on the surrounding infrastructure for bathrooms. They were dependent on it for food, for water. Um, I mean, you can't, you know, just because of the, the material facts on the ground of the city, you can't just break off. You're, a city is a, a dense concentration of economic activity that is set on uh, usually, well, in, with modern cities, impermeable cover. Uh, you know, there was an attempt to make a garden that you know, I saw some photos that made the design seem odd. Um, and if a group of people can't interact with their ecology and they don't have any kind of shared economic activity, understood in the broadest sense of just, you know, processing um, physical matter into goods and services and, and that sort of thing, then they just can't be autonomous in any meaningful way, except for the very limited, specific, psychi psychologically focused way that Peter talked about. Mm, yeah. Are you, are you talking about the garden with the pizza boxes? Yeah, it just it looked like... Um, and again, you know, I never know if these photos are being distributed specifically to make these people look bad. And that was some sort of intermediate stage. But it looked like sheet mulching that was being very poorly done yeah. uh, because the cardboard was exposed such that it will dry and then it will actually uh, repel water and and cause a kind of artificial drought um, because the water can't permeate it to get the soil. That kind of sheet mulching works well if you mulch it really heavily and the, the cardboard stays moist. Um, and the, then the, also the arrangement of the plants seemed very odd. But mm. again, I don't know. And I'm not going to be a back, backseat gardener for something I didn't actually see in person. That's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, if other people have different readings of the, of the yeah. shootings, because I haven't really looked into all of them uh, very much, um, if there's some, you know, given my propensity for what some people sometimes called conspiracy theory, it would be hypocritical of me to say that I totally um, made my mind up about those, which I haven't. Sure. So to bring in the next theme, I guess, this is from Shaheen, and he, uh, uh, he says, quote, the main question I have so far is what you are meaning when you say liberty. I see in the glossary on your website that you have provided the definition, but given that the word is half of the title of your show, I think you should spend more time exposing the concept and expounding the differences and similarities that Amory and, and Bellamy have of it. He, he adds uh, a further part where he talks about the work of uh, a Korean-German academic, Han byung Chu, um, which is... Uh, basically to say that, according to Han, real freedom is some, somehow socially anchored. He, also, he then also mentions the work of a man called Ramon Alani um, and how he decenters the question of human liberty by emphasizing how a connected, meaningful life is achieved by serving gods. Okay, so mm. what, he's, what he's doing with this feedback is trying to uh, prompt us to talk about liberty and freedom a little bit more. I took the opportunity of trying to uh, flesh this out a little bit by uh, by private message. And what he's adding here is um, that the way in which um, community, social anchoring, and individual autonomy can, can sometimes be at odds is where there is some kind of a, a duty or connection in a kinship structure 
um, that can cause these types of problems. And finally, he says, the concept of permanence, which is what deep rootedness would entail, is not friendly to the notion of individuals guided by nothing other than their whims and wishes. There has to be some kind of overarching duty that binds people. The degree to which this exists will have a great influence on the longevity of the community, not too much, not too little, but the existence of such an apparatus is at odds with a modern definition of individual autonomy. Yeah, there's a lot in there that I think is is really good. Um, I'd also frame this by pointing out that something I don't think I mentioned to you is that uh, like several weeks ago when our a previous episode went up on the website anarchistnews.org. As often happens, uh, one or more uh, anonymous commenters take the opportunity to you know, vent their spleens at me. And they were saying, making fun of us, both of us, for using the term liberty in the sense that it connotes this sort of Ra 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 Americana sense of freedom, you know, sort of me and my 40 acres. Um, I mean, I'm stretching out a little bit what they said yeah. in the sense that, um, you know, there's an American idea of freedom that is certainly a uh, partially tied up in settler colonialism and sort of being on the frontier um, where you are less affected by the proximity of states, but, you know, that was only possible through a an act of conquest and genocide and that sort of thing. And I, I get that. I mean, it would be naive to act as if that were not the case, but I certainly don't think that either on its own fulfills or exhausts the concept of liberty. And I don't There's so much in Shaheen's comment that I'm not quite sure where to approach it first. And I guess I would maybe invite you, since um, I believe in our conversations, you were actually the one who first brought up that term to, to say what it means to you. And we have a short definition of it on our website, but uh, maybe you can flesh it out a bit and then I'll sort of jump in and have a few things to say about Shaheen's comment. You know, this, yeah. is, this is live podcasting, folks. This unscripted. <laughs> One of the one of the things I think which is most central to the to these questions that Shaheen is raising is that uh, what degree is liberty? And I'll, I will give you my conception in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, necessary and sufficient, and or sufficient for a good life. Okay. Now, oh, sure, sure. I think that I would say liberty as a a quality or a state in a person's life an individual person's life which is what happens when they are uh free from the uh, interference of of others on their lives in a in a heteronymous way okay so when people make agreements in a sort of uh traditional very broad libertarian sense or live together and form communities um, it's hard to really look at any of that as sort of interfering with with people's lives um, I guess if a person consents to something which starts to sort of seem more like a kind of permanent um, norm um, but that's not been codified in any way and when they try to sort of step out of that or question it or challenge it, they come up against friendship. That would show that there really has been something reified. But I definitely think that liberty alone is not sufficient yes. for of life. And I think that so it, it's two things together. And perhaps there is some tension between them. But a sense of belonging and a sense of intimacy with the people that one lives with both in a sort of uh, psychological sense and also in a in a logistical living arrangement sense where they are able to give 
love and assistance to each other, I think that's certainly equally important as, as a person's liberty. But I, the reason why I don't tend to like throw off the idea of individual liberty altogether is because if you're going to look at a quality, especially one which is like the absence of negatives, you need an individual reference point. And I think it makes no sense to talk about group liberty or society's liberty because it's like whatever's going on in that group they'll have di will have different effects on different people so you need that individual refer reference uh, person to say his liberty is being infringed at this moment because of this okay i've got six or seven different things in my head now so uh we may or may not get to all of them because i'm wary of going too abstract and philosophical but um if i recall correctly shaheen's comment also included his mentioning something that i had brought up previously whereby um i spent a period where i was reading very heavily just about the theme of slavery across civilization um across the history of human societies in general and that I remarked somewhere, I, I can't recall where it was, it may have been on an earlier episode of this show, that one of the things that European explorers and merchants and slave traders and so forth who were coming into contact with West Africa consistently remarked on was the difference in the conception of freedom whereby for these sort of, you know, enlightenment period people, it was this idea of freedom from constraint, right? Sort of uh, negative freedom. And this concept didn't translate so well culturally, at least according to the scholar I was reading, who was Orlando Patterson, um, who's a, a Jamaican scholar of slavery who wrote a very interesting book called slavery and social death and the point that patterson was trying to make because he fleshes out this unusual nuanced definition of slavery that is not just about being under someone's control and having um you know your labor extracted from you forcefully because he says actually there are a variety of ways that those things can happen that it had to do with di being dishonored and being cut off from social ties. And so this West African conception was that to be free meant to have many kinship ties because those kinship ties were, were networks of protection and options for you to fall back on and people who would uh, support you in various ventures, whereas a slave was someone who had only one tie one tie to their master and they've been alienated from the community and suffered in, in his terms of sort of social death. They were no longer, so they were an outsider in the own community. They were a, someone who was on the liminal space of being human and not human really. And I'm sensitive to, to that kind of point of view, but I agree with you that there's something that doesn't quite comport with my thinking uh, to talk about community freedom. I mean, I think what this shows is that uh, a human can only be fully fulfilled within some sort of community. And maybe we can talk about community later. But um, I think I, I don't think Shaheen is doing this or uh, or quite taking a position on this. But I th it reminds me of a conversation that I had with someone who was, is very involved with the Inhabit project, which is this kind of international anti-state communist project. And this person in particular identifies as a, an ecstatic communist, which is kind of tongue in cheek. Um, but I, I had an extended conversation with this person whereby they eventually asserted the individual doesn't really exist, which I think is where a lot of communist or far left thinking pushes you toward if it doesn't actually positively assert it. And I find it to be not only false, but actually a bit sinister. Not that I think that 
this person who I was speaking to has horrible intentions. I think this person actually is committed to human freedom. But when you start to, to try to say that the individual doesn't quite exist, I think you... And, and the argument was because the individual is totally dependent on, you know, all these networks, be they ecological, economic, so, social, psychological. You're, you're asserting a falsehood that is lends itself so easily to authoritarianism and also just is demonstrably not true. You, you, if you introspect right now, you are basically a sort of point of consciousness that is opening to the world that has, is experiencing a particular field of, of sensory qualities and thoughts and emotions and has a particular perspective. And you can't get rid of that. Like that is the, the starting point of, of any philosophical inquiry and to try to, you know, say, uh, I'll stop there because I've been going in. Yeah. I, the, to me, that last, the last thing you're describing is, uh, you know, the same thing as what I've been holding to for over 10 years, the idea of moral libertarianism. Yes. I was just going to say it. The other thing is you, I, after, at least at this point in my life, I'm 32 fucking years old, and I've been thinking about this stuff a lot for 14 years. I'm not convinced that you can really, in any system of thought, get rid of the idea of choice or will of some kind. And I've thought about this a lot. I know there are arguments against it. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm the master of the universe, but... It, once you get rid of that, then you've gotten rid of ethics as well, if, if there's not some sense of choice. And so if there's no individual, how is their choice? How is their responsibility? How is their morality? Yeah, I certainly don't think, uh, as, you, as you were right to point out, that Shaheen is, is suggesting any of these things. Um, I think that the, one of the more interesting points worth just quickly zooming back to is... The notion of individuals guided by nothing other than their whims and wishes. Right, right. right. Both of us at various points in the past had some affinity with, you know, uh, psychological egoism. Mm -hmm. and, yes. and I always had the sense that some things it makes sense to wish for. And there was always this view that some of these things that you could have, that you could have on a whim or a wish, even if it like was the purest expression of freedom or liberty in one sense, it was flying in the face of so many aspects of the good in another. Um, and I think that's that's actually an important role that the community plays. You know, we talked before uh, about values, and I really think that. Not that the community determines the values, actually the values will determine the community, but then in turn, the, the community is a vessel through which uh, the importance of values is stressed. And that can help people when they, you know, have got some kind of desire pop into their head to, to determine for themselves using temperance and whatever else. Do I really want this? Because it may well have a, an adverse effect for me mm -hmm. in the community. Not that it has a bad effect on the community, because, again, I don't want to use the community itself as a reference object. But there is that, that, again, that comes down to choice. Yeah. To respond to Shaheen's other point, I, I definitely agree that liberty, freedom, autonomy is not sufficient as an end in itself and should not be reduced to acting on whims. And this is part of one of several major factors that pushed me away from the really hardcore Stirner egoist view was, okay, so when I tried to make the appeal to anarchism, I have to continually say that I'm not saying these values of, of anarchy and 
ecological harmony and all this sort of thing are standalone objective truths and values in themselves, but here are some pragmatic reasons that I think you should adopt them. And, you know, I think that doesn't quite cut the mustard for a lot of reasons. And to respond to Shaheen's point, I think a, a fuller idea of freedom is, is the freedom to do the good volitionally, to, to, to do the good in the sense of uh, beauty, justice, truth, etc., and to do it in a, a, a non-compelled way, and that that is part of being a, a fully realized person, but it's still happening at the individual level, even if that individual is networked in a serious way with a group of people, which hopefully the individual is. Yeah, I guess to finish my answer to your first question about the sort of working definition, I would say liberty is definitely like the the means. Um, you either have liberty or you don't at a given moment, and it's being infringed in a given way or not. And I think that I tend to think of autonomy more as like more like an end. Mm. Um, okay. So the we we live in a in a state of heteronomy, a control complex which affects us and our liberty in all kinds of ways and if the and if the goal is autonomy then um liberty has to be part of the means so let's bring that back to the chairs yeah <laughs> having, having unpacked some of the theory what can we now say meaningfully about my original question about how present was the idea of aut autonomy in the chairs well i think if you're defining it in that way as the sort of end where Maybe it's a kind of community homeostasis or something whereby a group of individuals have realized some substantial level of liberty, then I think autonomy was never really realistically on the menu. And I'm not sure how many people, I, I don't know that anyone really thought they would achieve that. Um, and it, again, this comes back to saying it, it, chop is a better term in that case. Um, and then the problem with the chop being that you can't actually petition and expect to get autonomy granted to you. I mean, it just doesn't happen. I mean, the only way a state would do that would be if they were just trying to, that their power was so restricted that they were just trying to save face in order to project power psychologically by saying, oh, yeah, you can you can secede um, in Seattle. <laughs> right. So obviously it's not going to happen. And, and I don't even think that that should. Count as a knock against chop because it's just it's just not within the means. Um, do, what's do you have a take on it? And I, I have a question for you as well. I was just going to bring. I was just going to add your question from the notes about that is the is one of the failures of Chaz that you just simply can't scratch build community based on a particular issue. Yeah. You say that absolutely you can't, and this comes back to the whole thing about the, the, the fundamental shared values again and the nature of an anarchist or a libertarian big ten that starts with zone and says right here we go this is what we're going to do even if it is like literally a big tent at say pork fest or something like that somebody, somebody is in control of the behavioral norms inside that tent or inside that zone and it's not something that's ethical in nature fundamentally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, the reason I put that question on there was I was actually thinking about our previous episode where we were talking a bit about the importance of shared values. And I think one of the reasons that I'm increasingly disillusioned, I mean, as I have been for you know, eight years now, I guess, with um, big scale politics, because I just don't see any way if you start at the point of Big, big tent, relatively big tent, activist uh, petitioning and protests, and that even includes 
riots and property destruction and that sort of thing when they are construed as aggressive forms of protest, which I have, you know, very much seen coming from a lot of the the Black Lives Matter Antifa nexus that, you know, it's okay for us to do this because then the state will listen to us. I don't see if you start at that point how you end up at autonomy in the way that we're defining it because you're still in this sort of, you know, politics is the continuation of war by other means kind of mindset where the assumption is mass society, the assumption is heteronomy of some kind, it's just going to be ideally us doing heteronomy to other people, which actually means only a small portion of you who are all doing this political thing together and the rest of you are going to fall under the new heterons along with all the people that you're perceiving as your enemies. And I, I just don't see a way out of that basic logic. And insofar as um, an autonomous zone ends up as an organized protest, I think it's entered into that logic. Thinking that you're going to be able to get community out of the political framework understood as that continuation of war by other means, I think is a mistake. I mean, the best thing that I think you can say about Chaz, understood as Chaz, not as Chop, is the same thing I was saying 10 years ago when everyone was making fun of Occupy Wall Street, who I knew, and I was saying, sure, I don't think... Sure, there are all kinds of problems with this, but one thing you can say about it is it's a psychological and social breaking out of the ordinary, breaking out of the routines of the dominant economy, breaking out of the autopilot mind, breaking out of the mass anonymity, and it's people recognizing some sense of agency, recognizing some sense of community, however attenuated, and saying, hey, actually, we can stop what we're doing and we can talk to each other and we can imagine different ways of being. And I don't want to minimize or scoff at the value of that. It would mean that one of the sort of most generous and positive readings of Chaz Chop could be that it was a kind of a kind of Taz. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there's not necessarily uh, so much reason to mourn it on that basis because it can be done again yeah. in, a, in a more spontaneous and temporary way in different places. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just wanted to touch on the the white fragility phenomenon, which is a concept, which is the title of a book by Robin D'Angelo, who is a uh, former corporate consultant turned um, social justice luminary, social justice understood as the political ideology. And I just thought it was interesting because, you know, we got a lot of blowback when I, in one of our first four episodes, said, you know, this woke ideology, this woke critical social justice, uh, whatever you want to call it, ideology is increasingly hegemonic. And I got some real pushback for saying that. People saying, how could you say that, you know, this is hegemonic because they're of the mindset of our, you know, society is overwhelmingly racist, sexist, heterosexist, you know, so on and so forth. And I think that that is a symptom of a kind of binary thinking where, you know, it, it has to be one or the other. And so the fact that we can point to uh, real instances and and even um, uh, hegemonic regions or areas or uh, spatiotemporal moments where uh, racism and so forth are hegemonic, therefore means that the the woke ideology could not possibly be the case. But I, again, I think that that betrays a a dualistic way of thinking, and that in fact, even insofar as the phenomena that I mentioned earlier are still present, of course, in varying ways to varying degrees, uh, various levels of intensity throughout different parts of the United States. Uh, that does not in any way mean that the woke ideology cannot, as it has, in fact, 
be taken up in a massive way in corporate culture, uh, Hollywood culture, mainstream media, um, academia, and um, and uh, big tech, you know, all sorts of power organs as their official ideology in the sense of what Orlando Patterson, who I mentioned earlier, would, um, I mean, not that he himself has actually said this, I'm adapting a concept of his, which is the idiom of power. So whenever you have authority, it needs some way to justify itself, which can be obfuscating that it exists, or it can be admitting that it exists and rationalizing it. And so in this sense, it's admitting that it exists and rationalizing it by saying, well, but we're actually for the good and we're for diversity, equity and inclusion and so forth. Um, and so now I, with the huge success of Robin D'Angelo um, and all these, uh, what would you call them, ideologically bamboozled people holding up you know, photos of themselves, like, look at me, I'm a good white person reading this book about how horrible I am. Um, ideas that have, would once only have found currency in liberal, liberal, liberal arts campuses or activist groups are now being heard in this big way. Robin D'Angelo gets $6,000 an hour to give talks on this, which is crazy. <laughs> it's crazy, crazy. And uh, for those of you who don't know it, it's, you know, a peculiar blend of this kind of social justice Maoism meets some weird form of anti-racist Freudianism, by which I mean all these claims are made about people's secret beliefs, which are, you know, they won't admit or that they may even not admit to themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so... Uh, it pushes a, an, an argument for a kind of systemic racism, which, you know, racism is a system. Everyone participates in it. Often people who put forward systemic racism theories emphasize that it can be uh, laws uh, and uh, economic factors that disparately affect different racial groups such that no one in the system actually has to be consciously racist for the system to produce uh racially dominating outcomes. And, but D'Angelo goes farther than this. So racism is a system, but also whites actually harbor deep-seated, hateful, and in some cases, according to her claims, sort of outrageously hateful views toward all non-whites. So she uses the example of, you know, if, you, if you're a white person and you encounter an intelligent black person, it just offends you on this massive level just the mere fact that this person is intelligent because you know, it threatens your sense of white power and control and your desire to think of this person as inferior. Um, and so, you know, what is, what is the remedy? Uh, it's to confess in the, this kind of ritualistic struggle session fashion um, and commit to anti-racism for life. And so people might say, okay, Bellamy, you know, maybe there are some goofy things about this book, but why is this such a bad thing? Well, of course, committing to anti-racism actually means getting on board with this kind of postmodern Maoist uh, social democratic political program. Uh, the more you want to, to push things like equal, equity, which actually means equality of outcome, um, the, the more you're going to have centralization, the more you're going to have bureaucracy, the more you're going to have micromanagement of every aspect of people's lives. Um, loss of privacy, loss of freedom of speech, loss of ability to, to criticize this system. And in fact, D'Angelo takes it to this maximalist level where th there's no way to criticize or even engage in dialogue according to the white fragility phenomenon. So this is the namesake. If you encounter this and you say, well, you know, wait a minute, I, I'm not sure what you mean by systemic racism. Can we talk about this? That's where the unfalsifiability comes in, because if you... If you say anything against this theory, the theory would claim, or the person, the theorist would say, ah, well, you're just proving my point. Exactly. But on this issue, uh, I would like to raise a question for the viewers. If they're under any doubt as to which is ideationally stronger in the world, real uh, white on other racism, 
in a systemic or an individual sense, accum accumulated individual sense or systemic sense, is that stronger or is, you know, um, woke ideology stronger? Consider this. The main thesis uh, from, from skim reading white fragility seems to be that when white people are shown their prejudices, even if they're not aware of them, or regardless of whether they're, you know, proven to be true in, in some kind of absolute sense, they become defensive and, uh, and they say things against it. Consider the same when you are a critic of the concept of white privilege and you explain that one of the dangers of this kind of framework is that it, it means that negative behavior among non-white communities, which is bad for them, goes, you know, it's insufficiently examined. It becomes, it becomes a problem which is ignored because everything can be blamed on white people. Okay, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter if, you know, you've got um, a particular problem that the black community is experiencing, which if you've got one way of looking at it, yes, there's agency there. They could do things. They could make their lives better. This is not to say that white on other racism doesn't exist, but if you want to think about which is strongest, if you're to, if, if you're like me and you've got all kinds of issues with the idea of white privilege and you and you critique the woke ideology, they go on the defensive. So, you know, they accuse white people who they insist are all racist of being on the defensive when they when they're questioned. But from my point of view, they're doing exactly the same. The difference is, if somebody wants to point out something that I've done or said, and uh, you know actually have a conversation with me about how they think that is in some way uh, racist or that I, indicates a privilege that I might hold, I would actually, have, in good faith, have a serious conversation with about it. But I know that real hardline wokesters, if I, tr if I try to say to them, you know, have an intellectual discussion about the concept of white privilege, that it will be no content and all just uh, rage and bile. Yeah, it's worth mentioning that, and I've seen <clears throat> a number of surveys about this now, that most most people who actually hardcore embrace the woke ideology are themselves white. And and prevailingly, it's a, a middle or higher class educated white person phenomenon. Many people who have this ideology, they haven't thought about it in an extremely serious, politically rigorous way. They are socially signaling, I'm an educated person, and what it means to be an educated white person now is to shit on white people, complain about Western civilization, talk about how awful white people are, which is basically a way of saying over and over, but I'm not one of those. You know, I, I'm of a superior breed, superior type. Um, but I just want to finish <clears throat> describing the white fragility concept because you, you sort of gestured at it, but... But the central concept of this book is if you if you criticize this, if if you say, well, I'm not sure about this or, well, here's a counter theory or, you know, can can you unpack that for me? Because I think there are some logical fallacies there. All of these are evidence of your white fragility, which is just you're so psychologically threatened by your privilege being challenged that it's just evidence of how you how deep your racism is and how you uh, you end up, this is why I said Freudism, you, you end up with all these psychic defense mechanisms that you think are arguments, that you think are objections, but they're really not. If you, if you get angry, if you uh, say, I, I don't want to talk about this, or you walk out of the you know, compulsory corporate uh, diversity sensitivity training seminar, or you just say, I don't want to engage with this, all of these are evidence of racism. So any, literally any, and I'm not exaggerating, you might think I'm, I'm strawmanning this, but I urge you to look at it. Anything except asking clarifying questions on the road to acceptance or acceptance itself is racism. And so it, it is maximalist woke. And um, it's kind of a cult, isn't it? If you're not, yeah. allowed, to, if you're not allowed to even yeah, raise, raise, raise questions which seem to affect the authority of what is being said. 
Yeah, and it plays on people's, you know, feelings of inadequacy and inferiority. It plays on people's tendencies towards conformism. It plays on people's tendencies toward what I talked about earlier, which is just using a sanctimonious embrace of the ideology as a social signaling mechanism. And unsurprisingly, the the alt right is very happy about this book. Um, Greg Johnson, the editor in chief of Countercurrents, which is a uh, He's about like a decade old um, uh, alt-right uh, uh, white nationalist uh, publishing platform. Greg Johnson is um, one of the major figures in the American alt-right. Um, uh, was was laughing on Twitter about how happy he is about this and how uh, no self-respecting person can actually take on D'Angelo's ideology. And so it will drive people to think in more identitarian ways, which is exactly what he wants. He's talked about how uh, ident- left-wing identity politics will inevitably create, as a response, right-wing white identity politics. And so, you know, I don't have too much to say about this because I don't think it deserves too much of our time, but I just wanted to comment on it because, well, partially just event because I'm in fucking graduate school and I have this stuff spoon-fed to me, but, um, but also just because I thought it, was a case in point of the point that I was trying to make in one of the early episodes and that I got flack for. And so I would just say, well, here is more evidence for my point. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's it for now. And I'll be coming back with the next episode being a either a solo one or maybe an interview um, talking about Chaz. Yeah. Until next time. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.